All right, so last time when we were talking about enthalpy, or change in enthalpy, delta H, and we were talking about how we can use that term as a molar ratio in a stoichiometry problem. So I introduced this equation, but we hadn't actually done the problem yet. So this is the equation for photosynthesis, where plants take uh, water and carbon dioxide and sunlight and convert it into sugar and oxygen. So here is our balanced chemical equation. The question here is asking to calculate the solar energy required to produce 75 grams of glucose, C6H12O6. So it's asking us to go from one term in this equation to another. So it gave us 75 grams of this thing, and it's asking how many kilojoules of energy end up over here. Whenever we have a balanced equation and we're given an amount of something in that equation and asked for an amount of another, that is stoichiometry. So what's the first step of stoichiometry? Good. Convert to moles. Whatever you are, get to moles. So it may not necessarily be grams to moles. In chapter four, we were given volume and concentration with the acid-base titrations, and we had to convert to moles or millimoles. But either way, get to moles or millimoles. So we have 75 grams of glucose. How do you convert mass to moles? From mass to moles? Mm-hmm. Good. Find the molecular mass of glucose. So down here, they've already given us the molecular mass of glucose is 180.2. Oh, that won't be given for you, of course, in a homework or test question, but just to save us time in lecture right now, that's done, oh, done for us. <laughs> glucose is pretty, <laughs> pretty common. You'll see that a lot. So once you have the molecular mass, now what? No, not. We're still trying to get to moles. Good. Divide the mass by the molar mass. So that's what they've done down here. You take your mass and you divide by the molar mass. Then grams will cancel and you're only left with moles. And this is moles of glucose, C6H12O6. So that's the first step, get to moles. Now what's the second step? Molar ratio. So a molar ratio is going to have whatever you started with, which is glucose here, where in that ratio, top or bottom? Bottom, good. So C6H12O6 goes down there in the bottom. What goes in the top? What we want, what do we want? We're not being asked for another species, we're asking for the what? Kilojoules, so that's what goes on top. These numbers in the ratio, where do they come from? I should give myself more space here. Which numbers? What numbers go in front of the ratio here, top and bottom? Where do those numbers come from? Up there, Up there the equation, right. So there's an understood one in front of glucose, so we're just going to put one on the bottom. If there had been a two there, we would have put a two on the bottom. <coughs> Number one. On the top, we put our kilojoules, which is 2,803. I really should have given myself more of a space here. Let me, yeah, I will just open a new slide. So 0.416. moles C6, H12, O6, multiplied by the molar ratio. And on the bottom, we have one mole of C6H12O6. And on the top, we have 2,803 kilojoules per mole. So as far as units, what cancels? Moles and C6H12O6, and we're left with what? Just kilojoules, 4.16 times 2,803 is what? 1,166, yeah. Well, we've only got three sig figs, so we're going to round that to 
1,170, which to show that that zero isn't significant, we'll put it in, in scientific notation. And third, kilojoules per mole. Or not per mole, just kilojoules. And this problem was on page 199. I could have asked this question in reverse. I could have given you this equation and said, how many grams of glucose are formed when the plant absorbs this many kilojoules of energy? In that case, the first step, convert to moles, we can skip because kilojoules are in our molecular equation here. So we don't have to convert it to a different unit before jumping into the ratio. So the three steps of stoichiometry, we can solve these problems using only two of those steps. So here, we just converted moles, multiplied by the ratio, and we were done. We didn't have to convert to a desired unit because we were already in our desired unit here. If I give you this question in reverse, which if you're looking on page 199, practice problem B is in reverse. It says calculate the mass and grams of oxygen that is produced by photosynthesis. <laughs> Bless you. When 2.49 times 10 to the fourth kilojoules of solar energy is consumed. In that case, you would just take that kilojoules of energy, multiply by the molar ratio, taking note that oxygen has a coefficient of six, so that will go into your molar ratio and then convert to the desired unit, you'll be left with moles of oxygen, so you need to multiply by the molar mass of oxygen to get that to grams. So, how we feel about this equation? And this could be any chemical equation, it doesn't have to be photosynthesis. If I give you any chemical equation and ask you to go between the energy term and one of the say, species in grams, it's only gonna be two steps. Sound good? So, getting into calorimetry, which is what we are going to be doing in lab tomorrow, calorimetry. So, calorimetry is a way of measuring the thermodynamics of a reaction by a change in temperature. So, we're going to have to use some equations here. We're going to have to know some terms in order to be able to convert from temperature changes to the amount of heat that is involved in the reaction. So, first terms we're going to need to know. Specific heat versus heat capacity. Now, depending on what textbook you're using or you're using an internet source, sometimes they use these two terms interchangeably. Our textbook says that they are different terms, so just be careful if you're looking at outside sources, you might see them <coughs> using the same term, but they're actually two different terms for our textbook's purposes. So the specific heat is given by the symbol lowercase s. It's defined as the amount of heat it takes to raise exactly one gram of a pure substance by one degree Celsius. Whereas the heat capacity is given by the letter uppercase C, and it's defined as the amount of heat it takes to raise an entire object, regardless of whether or not that object is a pure substance, it could be a mixture of substances, regardless of what the size of that object is, by one degree Celsius. So the units are going to be different for specific heat versus heat capacity. Specific heat is going to have units of joules. Stole an eraser. <coughs> yeah. Joules per gram times degree Celsius. While heat capacity, because it's an entire object rather than just one gram of the substance, is just going to be joules per degree Celsius. So this is kind of a measure of how easily things heat up. If things transfer heat very easily and heat up very easily, then they will have very low heat capacities. What kind of materials transfer heat really easily? Metals, right. So we would expect metals to have relatively low heat capacities. What about water? Does water transfer heat? Yes, but not compared to metal, does it transfer easier or harder than metals? Harder than metals. So we expect compared to a metal, water to have a higher heat capacity. It takes more energy to raise the temperature of water than it does to change the temperature of most metal. 
So water has a heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Where have we seen that number before, 4.184? Where did we see it last time? Anybody remember? Where have we seen the number 4.184 last class? Anybody remember? Good, it's the number of joules in a calorie. It's the conversion unit. So remember, joules is our SI derived unit for energy. This came from a Newton meter. Whereas I said that the common units more commonly used here in the US are calories. So common units are oftentimes based off of some constant value rather than being based off of deriving it from SI values. So calorie, where it came from, was the specific heat of water. One calorie is how much energy it takes to raise one gram of liquid water by one degree Celsius. So that's why it's the same number, 4.184. So for over here. Where are we going to use this equation for? Q again is heat. So we're going to have two equations, whether we're heat capacity or specific heat. For heat, for the specific heat, the equation is that Q, our heat, is equal to S, that specific heat, times M, our mass, times delta T, our change in temperature. Now looking at the units, S has, has units of joules per gram degree Celsius. Therefore, our mass needs to be in units of what? Grams, good. Why is that important to note? Well, we had an equation last time where the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mu squared. In that equation, the mass had to be in what unit? Kilograms, good. So make sure you pay attention to your units in order to make sure everything cancels. This one, the mass has to be in grams, and the kinetic energy, it had to be in kilograms. Now, delta T. Delta T is the change in temperature. Do we have to convert to Kelvin to find a change in temperature? Or can we leave it in degrees Celsius? It actually doesn't matter, as we learned in chapter one, because degrees Celsius and Kelvins are technically the same length. It doesn't really matter. Here, though, because we have degrees Celsius in our unit for specific heat, you might as well just leave it in degrees Celsius. That's what I'm going to give it to you in. So delta T can be in degrees Celsius. And delta means it's a change. So that's just final minus initial, which means that this term, delta T, can be either positive or negative. It's positive if you're going up in temperature. It's going to be negative if you're going down in temperature. So if you're going down in temperature, you'll end up overall with a negative value for Q because you're losing heat. Whereas if you go up in temperature, you end up with a positive value for Q because you're gaining heat. You could also, if instead of looking at a, uh, a pure substance and you, that you know what it is, say you're heating up an entire object, you may or may not know what that object is or whether or not it's a pure substance, it could be a mixture of things, and you may have a heat capacity given to you for that substance, in which case you just multiply by the change in temperature. Because heat capacity is just in joules per degree Celsius, degree Celsius, and delta T is in degree Celsius, so multiply the two and you'll just be left with Q heat in terms of joules. Yeah, make sure your units are canceling out. Heat. heat. Yep. Yes. Q is the heat. Yeah. All right. So here's a table of common substances and their specific heats on page 200 at the bottom here. And there is our liquid water. I keep on specifying liquid water. As though it's not in this table, water does have different specific heats depending on its state of matter. It doesn't take the same amount of energy to raise the temperature of liquid water that it does to take, raise the temperature of water in the gas phase. So that's why we specify this is liquid water, is 4.184. Whereas if you look at the metals here, they have lower um, heat capacities, or specific heats here. Now I'm getting it mixed up lower specific heats. Of metals or of just any sub? No, not off the top of my head. So the higher the heat, 
higher the specific heat, the more energy it takes to change the temperature of that substance. Yes. I your, your tests are going to be open to book for this class, so you just as long as you can refer to the table. Although honestly, either it's going to be water, which is always 4.184, or I would probably give it to you right there in the problem, so you don't have to go looking for it in the ta table. So as long as you have in your equation sheet that water is 4.184, you'll probably be fine. Most time questions are like this: are finding what the heat capacity is if it's not water. All right. So let's go ahead and try this out for a simple problem here. Calculate the amount of energy, or the amount of heat in kilojoules that's required to heat 255 grams of water from 25.2 degrees Celsius to 90.5 degrees Celsius. So just like last time I said, this, equation, this chapter has a lot of formulas. So making your own formula sheet, making notes in the formula sheet, the hardest part of this chapter is figuring out what formula to use. So on your equation sheet, I recommend next to each equation having a description of what kinds of problems you would use that equation for. So next to the equation Q is equal to SM delta T, I would write this is the equation to use when you are changing the temperature of either water or substance. <coughs> this is the equation to use. It's also the equation that has delta T in it, so that's your other big hint. If you're changing temperature, you're using the equation that has delta T in it. So in this case, our substance is water. So for water, specific heat is 4.184. We're given our mass right there in the problem to be 255 grams. To calculate delta T, we're going to take our final temperature, which is 90.5, and subtract from it your initial temperature, which is 25.2, no need to go to Kelvin, and that gives us a delta T value of 65.3. Now we just plug them into our equation, Q is equal to SM delta T. When we do that, what happens here to our units? <coughs> Good, we're left with only joules because grams will cancel and degrees Celsius will cancel. We'll be left with just joules. Now we're multiplying, all these numbers are bigger than one, so we should get them with a really big number here. Sixty-nine thousand. Well, we've only got three sig figs, right? So we'll just round that to sixty-nine thousand seven hundred joules. Are we done? No. Why? Good. Pay attention to what unit it asks for. This one asks for kilojoules. So what's our last step here? Good. Divide by a thousand to get it to joules. So if we divide sixty-nine thousand by a thousand, we get what? Sixty-nine point seven. Good. Kilojoules. And there's our final answer. How bad was that problem? Is that all? <coughs> Compared to chapter four, are we doing better? <laughs> yes, much better than chapter four. <laughs> all right. So let's look at what kind of process we would go through to measure these changes in temperature. So in the last class, when we were talking about deriving equations, we said that Q, the heat, is equal to the enthalpy when you are at constant pressure, which I said for the purposes of the thermochemistry we use in this class, we're generally going to be at constant pressure because we don't have equipment to change the pressure here. So let's look at constant pressure calorimetry. At constant pressure calorimetry, the most common and easiest and cheapest, <laughs> because it's made literally out of styrofoam cups, kind of calorimeter is commonly called a coffee cup calorimeter. So a coffee cup calorimeter is 
just two styrofoam cups nested together to provide insulation. Not perfect, but it's cheap and easy. Inside of this chamber here, we're going to have some sort of reaction mixture. Whether this is a chemical reaction going on here or a physical reaction going on here, we are going to have some sort of reaction that is going to change our temperature. Here, the reaction mixture, let's say that this is a chemical reaction. Let's give you an example of a chemical reaction that is going to produce a change in temperature. So a couple of weeks ago, when you did the lab that I wasn't here for, when you had the substitute, one of the chemical reactions that was kind of hard to tell whether or not it reacted was sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid because it did not produce a color change or precipitant or bubble or anything like that. It was more subtle. It released heat, which unless your hand was like underneath the chem plate, you probably wouldn't have noticed that change in temperature. Oh yes, then they would definitely bubble. Those yeah, those would have bubbled if, it, if yeah. you had any solid, yeah. yeah so. so sodium hydroxide, which is a base, plus hydrochloric acid, which is an acid. What are the products of that? Salt and water. Good, salt and water. And I'm not worrying about states of matter right now, but salt and water. This is an acid-base neutralization reaction. They are exothermic, which means that they do what? Release heat. So if this is releasing heat, what happens to its surroundings, its temperature of the surroundings? Heat up, it goes up. So inside of this coffee cup, let's say that this reaction is going on inside of the coffee cup here. So if this is my chemical reaction, okay, I'll add in states of matter to maybe make this more obvious. Aqueous, aqueous, salt is still aqueous, and water is liquid. If our reaction here are the chemicals, what is the surroundings that's going to absorb that heat and go up in temperature? Water. water, good. So water is your surroundings here. So when we say surroundings here, S-U-R-R -R stands for surroundings. In the case of a coffee cup calorimeter, your surroundings are going to be water. Whereas your system will be, in this case, the chemicals that are reacting will be your system. So while the chemicals that are reacting are losing heat, the surroundings of the water is absorbing the heat. So what this is saying right here is that all of the heat that is lost by the system is the same magnitude of heat that is gained by the surroundings. We're assuming that nothing else is lost, but opposite in sign. So in this case, it's exothermic. The reaction will have a negative Q, it's losing heat. The water around it will have a positive Q, it's gaining heat, its temperature is going up. But because we can't really stick a thermometer on these little tiny ions in solution to measure what their temperature change is, they're not really going to have a temperature change because it's just ions floating around, we can measure the change in temperature of the surrounding water. And if we can calculate the change in heat of the water, that will tell us what the change in heat of our reaction was. So that's what we're going to be doing in lab tomorrow. We're going to have a chemical reaction that produces heat, and we're going to measure how much heat was produced by the reaction by how much it changed the temperature of the surrounding water. So let's try this out with a physical reaction instead of a chemical reaction. So this is determining the heat capacity of a piece of metal. Now this kind of a cal calorimetry is typically used to identify an unknown metal. So this is actually the lab that my online students will be doing this week instead of the lab you're doing, but same idea. They're going to be determining an unknown metal by uh, heating it up and measuring how much it changed the temperature of water when they dropped it into room temperature water. Now in this particular question, the wording of it on the slides is asking for the heat capacity. I'm going to ask you for the specific heat because specific heat is more useful in identifying an unknown. Specific heat which is S, which is in joules per gram degree Celsius, S. More useful than S. So let's look at the problem. A metal pellet with a mass of 100 grams, originally at 88.4 degrees Celsius, is dropped into 125 grams of water that's originally at 25.1 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of both the pellet and the water is 31.3 degrees Celsius. Calculate the specific heat in joules per gram degree Celsius of the metal pellet. 
So we're going to use the equation Q is equal to SM delta T. But we're given here multiple masses and a lot of different temperatures. So what are we trying to so solve for here? What we're going to do is we're first going to solve for the heat of the water, because we know what water is, we know what specific heat of water is, so that's pretty easy to solve for. And then, because we know all of the heat absorbed by the water was released by the metal pellet, we'll plug that Q into Q is equal to SM delta T for the metal and solve for S of the metal. So let's go ahead and look at all of these numbers. It's kind of overwhelming at first, I know, and just label what they all are. So first number we have up here is 100 grams. What is that? That's the mass of the metal. So I'm not just going to say M because I have another mass here. I'm going to say M of the metal. So I'll put M subscript M. Whereas 125 grams is M of the what? W of the water. All right. So 88.4 degrees Celsius, that's the temperature. Is that initial or final? Initial, that's, that's the initial temperature of what? The water or the metal? Okay. Metal. So sub I and then sub sub metal. And then 25.1 degrees Celsius, that's another initial temperature, but that's the initial temperature of the what? Water. Good. Final temperature, 31.3 degrees Celsius, so that's a T final of what? The water or the metal? Both. So that's the final temperature for both the water and the metal. <laughs> Other pieces of information we might need, we're told that it is water, so we know that S of the water is what? Good. 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So what can we calculate right now? Q of the metal or Q of the water? Q of the water. So let's calculate Q of the water first. So Q of the water is equal to S of the water, so 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Oh. M of the water, which is 125 grams. And then delta T, so that's going to be our final temperature, 31.3 degrees Celsius, minus the initial temperature of the water, which was 25.1. Celsius, and that will give us joules of the water. That's right there. The final temperature of oh, both the water and the metal. Sorry, yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's the final temperature of the water. Getting three thousand two hundred forty-two point six. Yep. Three hundred forty-two point six joules. So that is Q of the water. Everybody got that? We move on. All right, so next, running out of space, so let me open another slide up. Yeah, I did open that slide. So the next concept we're going to use is to get from Q of the water to Q of the metal. So what is going to be the relationship between Q of the water and Q of the metal? What's going to be the relationship there? Equal but opposite in sign. So Q of the water we found to be 3,242.6, which means Q of our metal will be what? Good, negative 3,242. What was that? 242.6 joules.
All right. So now let's find if we have Q of the metal, go back to Q of the metal will be equal to the S of the metal times the mass of the metal times the change in temperature of the metal. We now have Q of the metal. That's what we can plug in right there. We want to solve for what is S, the specific heat of the metal. So now we need the mass of the metal and the change in temperature of the metal. So let's start plugging things in. Q of the metal is negative 3,242.6 joules. S of the metal, that's what we're solving for, times, what's our mass of the metal? Good, 100 grams. Now delta T of our metal, what was our final temperature of the metal? Now final temperature of the metal? 31.3 degrees Celsius. Minus, what was our initial temperature of the metal? Good, 88.4. Which is our delta T, should give us a negative delta T there. So for this point part right here, I'm getting negative 57.1 degrees Celsius. Bring the other side. And then divide it by 100 grams. Do our units cancel or combine? Combine. So we're left with on this side, change color here, we're left with joules over degrees Celsius times grams, or joules over gram degrees Celsius. Is that a valid unit for S, our specific heat? Yes, that is. I'm getting 0.568 That's for an answer. Always make sure that your answer makes sense. This is a metal. Even if looking at our table, we're looking at specific heats. Do, 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 do. Does 0.568 look like it's about what some of these metals are? Yeah, I mean, aluminum's 0.9, iron's 0.44, so it's somewhere around there. It's, it's a valid specific heat for a metal. If I had gotten like 50-something, would that have been a valid specific heat for a metal? No, that number would not have made sense. That would have been, oh, I did something wrong, like forgot to divide by grams or something like that. So make sure your answer makes sense. Now, this, of course, is not a very complete table. We could have had several more specific heats, including the specific heats of alloys, and we could have identified the metal, whether it is a pure metal or an alloy, from a more complete table, which is what my online students got to do. So exciting. No, go back, forward. There we are. Any questions on how to do this? Which number? This number? So that's the negative 3,242.6 divided by negative 57.1 and divided by 100. If you're not putting the denominator in parentheses, make sure you put divided by 57 and then divided by 100. Because if you don't use parentheses and you just multiply by 100, it thinks it's on the outside. And you'll be off by a factor of 4. Or 10 to the 4. I feel like we can handle this in the lab tomorrow. We can do this math. All right. So as I said earlier, reactions can also release or absorb heat. So here is the heat of neutralization of the reaction that I gave you earlier. Hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide turns into salt water. 
It has a molar heat of neutralization, or the amount of heat that was released by that reaction, is negative 56.2 kilojoules per mole of reaction. So in other words, it's going to release a lot of heat. Comparatively, if I take water and I ionize it into hydrogen and hydroxide ions, that has a positive delta H. So what does that mean about this reaction, ionizing water? Is it endothermic or exothermic? But, uh, endothermic. Does that mean this one right here? No, not salt. Uh, like oxide of water. Is that true? Mm -mm. It, depends. it depends on the reaction. This, this, is, this is the auto ionization of water. So this is not ionizing because of something we've added. Oh. This is just it ionizing on its own. Yeah, either because it's auto ionizing, which water does at room temperature by itself, or because you're electrolyzing it. So. And then heat of fusion. So what does it mean by fusion? By looking at this, even if you didn't know what the word fusion meant, look at this reaction. What does it look like? Melting liquid. I'm going from solid water to liquid water. So when we say fusion, that's what we're talking about is melting. Versus vaporization, what's going on there? Evaporation. Good. So that's evaporation. Now, notice this little star asterisk right there says measured at 25 degrees Celsius. So in other words, that's evaporation, not boiling. If you're boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, then it's a different value. It takes less energy if you're at the boiling point to turn water into steam. Because if you're already at the boiling point, it's going to happen a lot easier than sitting there at room temperature. All right. So that was constant pressure calorimetry. Now let's look at constant volume calorimetry. So in constant volume calorimetry, the pressure can change. This is typically used for reactions that can't really happen underwater or at least with the reaction exposed to water. So what is a chemical reaction that's very hard to happen underwater? Combustion, right? Very hard to get fire to burn underwater. Now, because we do not have this equipment, tomorrow's lab is a combustion. We are burning marshmallows into chips and then in cuts like that. We're still going to do it as constant pressure calorimetry, which means we're going to have a high margin of error because we're not going to be able to have the burning thing actually happen underwater. So a lot of heat's going to be lost to the atmosphere. But that's OK for the purposes of what we're trying to do for that lab. It's OK, and I'll explain more of that tomorrow. But if I was working for the FDA, and I need to know exactly how many calories are in those McDonald's um, uh, Big Macs, then I would be using a more accurate instrument, which is called a bomb calorimeter, because is used for combustion under pressure usually or allowing it to change in pressure. So the way this thing works is I have a sample down here and this sample is in a container, a closed container that is under water. But the container itself is not full of water. In fact, it is full of oxygen. And in order to make sure this thing burns completely all the way, we're going to actually pump in more oxygen. We're going to keep on pumping in oxygen to complete that combustion, have it go all the way combusted. So while this sample is burning all the way, all that heat that is being released is being absorbed mostly by the surrounding water. But that's not the only thing that is absorbing the heat. What else is absorbing the heat? Not just the surrounding water, but what? Well, the beaker around it, so the containers absorbing it, the buckets absorbing it, all of this metal contraptions and glassware, all of that is also absorbing heat. So to get an accurate measurement from a constant volume calorimeter, rather than just using a specific heat of water like we did with constant pressure calorimeters, we're going to use the heat capacity of the entire calorimeter. So the heat capacity, again, is C. So for this case, to calculate Q, the heat, we're going to use that second equation, Q is equal to C delta T. By the way, if you're having trouble remembering what these equations are, I had a student a couple of years ago who called them this, and for some reason, it helped me remember it. So maybe it'll help you remember it. He called these equations Q is equal to SMAT or CAT, because the delta kind of looks like an A. So every time I said, what equation do we use? He yelled out, SMAT. If it helps you remember which equation to use, sure. So SMAT is for constant pressure calorimetry, which is the coffee cup. And CAT is for the bomb calorimeter. 
Not to be confused with Schrodinger's cat, that was poison, not a bomb. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a, I think it was a cyanide pellet. He didn't actually do it, by the way, but theoretically it was going to be a cyanide pellet. <laughs> All right, so in this case, this is how we find how much heat is released by a combustion reaction, such as burning food to figure out how many calories are in it. So. Because, once again, the heat is being released by the reaction, absorbed by the calorimeter, in this case, we would take that Q is equal to cat reaction and write that the Q of the reaction is equal to opposite of the Q of the calorimeter. That's Q of the calorimeter right there. So same amount, but opposite in sign. So let's try this out. So we're on page 219 right now, famous Amos cookies. So these are the kind of cookies you typically find in vending machine units or in gas stations. Ironically, several semesters ago when I was doing this problem, there happened to be a student sitting in here with had just gone down to the vending machines and he had a bag of famous Amos cookies in his backpack, which he pulled out for, for fun. <laughs> and we looked at him last, see if we get the same numbers that it claimed on the bag. So when the bags of these things claim that their cookies have however many calories, where did they get those numbers from? And how does the FDA check and make sure they're not lying about it? Yes? So this type of reaction where we're finding out how many calories, mm -hmm. does our, like, does our body use 39.97 kilojoules mm -hmm. to transfer it into the type of energy that our body uses? No, in this case, the 39.97 is the calorimeter, but the reaction is the same. So the digestion reaction, or the, well, not it's digestion, it's Digestion then goes to the cells, and then your cells, the, direct, the reaction that your cells use to convert glucose into energy is actually combustion if you look at it. Because just like fire, we take in oxygen and we release heat. That's why we're warm-blooded. So. so we can like, find out exactly how many joules of energy that like, a person would use to digest the cookie. Yes. Instead of just burning it. Assuming that our body is perfectly efficient, which obviously it's not, but assuming, yeah. Yeah, so this is why this is why we need to eat because we need joules of energy. If you don't eat all day, if you skip breakfast, you kind of feel sluggish, right? And that's because you're running out of energy. That's where our energy comes from. These joules of energy come from food. You don't eat food, you don't get energy, you get sluggish and can't move around very much. All right, so in this problem, a famous Amos bite-sized chocolate chip cookie weighs 7.25 grams. We're going to burn it in a bomb calorimeter to determine this energy content. So by energy content, this is usually how many joules or calories, depending on what unit per gram. In this case, we're gonna do joules per gram. In lab tomorrow, we're gonna do calories per gram. Joules per gram. The heat capacity of this particular calorimeter, so that's C of the calorimeter, is 39.97 kilojoules per degree Celsius. During combustion, the change in temperature in the water of the calorimeter, so that's delta T, increases by 3.90 degrees Celsius. Determine the energy content in kilojoules per gram, so here we're going to want kilojoules per gram of the cookie. Now, why do we have to have that per gram in there? Well, it's not really fair to just say this cookie has more kilojoules of energy than that cookie if one cookie is that big and the other cookie is this big. That's not really a fair comparison. So when we're comparing energy content, we do it per gram. We're gonna do the same thing tomorrow because we're gonna be comparing things like a big marshmallow to a little piece of popcorn. So it's just saying, oh, the marshmallow had more kilojoules of energy or more calories. That's not really fair unless you do it per gram to figure out, well, yeah, it had more calories, but it also had a lot more mass than the piece of popcorn did. So dividing by the grams, the mass of it gives a more uh, equal representation of which one has more energy content. So in this case, first of all, let's find Q of the calorimeter, make it negative, and that will tell us Q of the reaction. So it's just cat. So Q of the reaction is equal to negative C of the calorimeter times delta T. So C of the calorimeter was that 39.97 kilojoules per degree Celsius. Delta T was 3.9. O degrees Celsius. Degrees Celsius will cancel and we'll be left with kilojoules.
So 39.97 times 3.9 is 155.88. Put 0.9 kilojoules. So that is my Q of the reaction. Why is it negative? It released heat, right? We burned the cookie. As we know, fire releases heat. When the question, though, is asking for the content, meaning an amount, can an amount be negative? No. If you look on a bag of any food and it says calories, it's not going to say negative calories. Although, technically, all of those things, when you eat them or you burn them, it's releasing heat. We're not including the negative because the negative says the reaction is releasing heat. But what we're really looking for right now is, well, how much energy did it contain that was released? So be careful with the wording of the questions in this chapter. If it's asking you for an amount, you're going to leave off the negative. Now, I'm less picky on the test, but if you're entering this into a connect question and you left the negative on, it would count it wrong. So it's just asking you for an amount here. So leave off the negative. Otherwise, connect thinks you did it wrong. So. 155.9 kilojoules was what the energy was of the cookie, but we want it not in kilojoules, but in what? Kilojoules per gram. So we're going to take those kilojoules and we're going to do what with it? Good. Divide by the grams, which was the 7.25. So 155.9 kilojoules divided by the 7.25 grams gives us 21.5, yep. 21.5, and that's now in kilojoules per gram. And there's your final answer, 21.5 kilojoules per gram. Feeling about this? Good. Yeah. All right. That is the end of calorimetry. We have two more sections, and both of these sections are different ways of determining the enthalpy of a reaction, two different methods. First one is Hess's law, and the second one is through enthalpies of formation. So, Hess's law. Hess's law states that if you add reactions together, you may do this for a couple of different reasons. These may be small reactions that add up to a bigger reaction. This could be you're adding these reactions because you're trying to determine the enthalpy of a reaction that's really hard to do, but you can add up reactions that are easy to do and measure to get its enthalpy. Hess's law states once you add them together, then your final reaction's enthalpy is just the sum of the enthalpy of the individual reactions. That is Hess's law. So if you have some reaction 1 with delta H1, and you add reaction 2 with a delta H2, your final reaction, its delta H, is just going to be the sum of the delta H's of the reactions that went into it. That is all it is. Easy enough concept. We're just going to add the reactions. Now, when you add reactions, Things that are on the same side of the equation add together. Things on opposite sides cancel out, just like algebra. What is kind of tricky about Hess's law, though, is I'm not going to tell you whether or not the reactions are going to be added together as is or whether or not you're going to have to manipulate it. So before we did the photosynthesis problem last class, I skipped over some slides saying I'm going to skip over these right now because I. Don't use those to explain the photosynthesis problem, but they will be used for a later problem. So we're going to go back to those slides really quickly now. And those are the equations about what happens to your enthalpy term when you manipulate an equation somehow. So shoot, equation manipulation. So the first one, rule of manipulating equations, always states states, states of matter for both reactants and products. This is going to be also very important in the last section, enthalpies of formation, because those enthalpy values will be different for 
gas versus liquid for water, for example, or whatever you're looking at. So that's just the first one is more of a disclaimer really than a rule. Second rule, if you take an equation and you multiply it through by a number, say you double the reaction, anything you do to the equation, you do to the enthalpy value. For example, here is our fusion of water. Fusion of water has a delta H value of 6.01 kilojoules per mole. If I double the reaction or multiply it through by 2, I'm also going to double my enthalpy value. If I tripled it, I would triple my enthalpy value. If I divided through by 2, I would divide my enthalpy value by 2. So that's the first kind of manipulation you can do to an equation. You might double it or triple it or half it. You, whatever you do to the equation, though, you have to also do to the enthalpy value. So that's the first kind of manipulation you can do. The second kind of manipulation you can do is you can reverse an equation. If you take an equation and you reverse it, you flip it, you're going to change the sign of its enthalpy value. For example, here is the combustion of methane. Methane plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. It has a delta H value of negative 890.4 kilojoules per mole. As we know, fire hot. It's releasing heat. Yes, fire hot. It's releasing heat. That's why we have a very large, very negative delta H value. It's releasing a lot of energy. If I were to run this reaction in reverse, take carbon dioxide and water and form methane and oxygen, the reverse reaction would still be 890 kilojoules of energy, but it would now be positive. It would now be endothermic. So all we're doing here is switching the signs. So those are the two main kind of manipulations you have with uh, thermodynamic equations. You can either multiply or divide through by a constant, in which case do the same to the enthalpy value, or you can reverse the equation, in which case flip the sign. All right, back to Hess's law. So in Hess's law, didn't mean to do that. Next slide. All right, so I love how your slides totally don't tell you how to do this problem. <laughs> it just jumps right into the problem. But it's going to look like this. Given the following known equations and their enthalpy values, in this case we're given three equations, determine what the enthalpy is for a following equation here. So here are three known equations. I want to know what is the enthalpy value for the final equation here. This is a puzzle. It is a jigsaw puzzle. And here on the bottom, this equation is what we want. So if in the example of a jigsaw puzzle, this is going to be here the picture on the box. This is the picture we're trying to make. These up here are our three puzzle pieces. And we need to rearrange them, maybe flip them upside down, maybe make them a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, in order to get them to fit together to make our puzzle. So I'm going to number them equation one, two, and three, just to make our math a little bit easier here. So I'm going to call that equation one versus equation two versus equation three. And I'm also going to add another slide for us to do our math on. All right. Going through this equation, what we're trying to get, we're going to go one piece at a time and identify which puzzle piece is going to give us that and whether or not we need to manipulate it. So the first thing we need, we need NO, nitrogen monoxide. Which equation, one, two, or three, will give us that? One, right there, NO. So, do I ha next question, do I have the correct number of NOs? Or do I need to multiply my first equation through by a constant? Correct. correct number, I don't need to multiply it through by a number or divide it through a number. Next question, is NO on the correct side of the equation or do I need to flip that equation? It's on the correct side of the equation, which means I can take equation one and I can add it into my puzzle without changing anything about it, which means its delta H value will not change at all. So I'm going to go over to my blank sheet of paper and I'm going to rewrite this equation as is, including its delta H value without changing a thing. So NO gas plus ozone gas made NO2 plus O2.
And then my delta H value, because I didn't change anything, my delta H value is still going to be that negative 198.9. Didn't change a thing. All right. Check. Next thing, I need atomic oxygen, meaning an oxygen by itself, no subscript. Which equation, 1, 2, or 3, will give me atomic oxygen? Equation 3, right there. OK, so there's equation 3. There's my atomic oxygen. Next question, do I have the correct number of oxygen atoms? No. I need how many? I need one. I have two. So what do I need to do to equation 3? Divide the entire thing by 2. Next question, is it on the right side of the equation, or do I need to reverse it? I need to reverse it. I need it as a reactant. It's currently a product, so I'm going to take equation 3. I'm going to divide by 2, and I'm going to reverse it. So when I reverse this, my oxygen, atomic oxygen becomes a reactant, and 2 divided by 2 is just going to give me 1. I'm going to rewrite this. Just one oxygen. And what am I going to have on the product side? What? O2, but how many of them? 1 over 2. I'm going to have a half of an oxygen because I'm going to take this entire equation and divide by 2. So I only have half of an O2. So I have 1 half of an O2. Everybody see where we got that from? Now, what about my delta H value? How is this positive 495 kilojoules going to change? Good. It's going to become negative because we reversed it, and we're going to have to divide by 2. So what's 495 divided by 2? Negative what? 47.5. All right. So now we've got the atomic oxygen. Last piece here is we need NO2. Well, we already had NO2 from our first equation. So let's add this together and see what we end up with. Went too fast there. Didn't like that. OK. So when we add this together, we have NO gas. We have O3 gas. We have O gas goes to an O2 gas. How many O2s do I have here? I have an understood one there, and I have a half here. They're on the same side of the equation, so we're going to add them up. So how many total O2s do I have on the product side? Good, three halves. This is going to be three halves, O2 gas. And then Hess's law, what is the delta H of this thing? Good. We're going to add up those delta H's to get what this delta H is. Negative 446.4. Did we make our picture? Did we make what we wanted? No. no, what's wrong? There's a whole bunch of stuff in there that we don't want. What do we not want here? O3, we don't want that guy. What else do we not want here? Good, we don't want that three halves of oxygen too, because what we want, looking at this equation, is just the NO, the O, and the NO2. So we only want to keep NO, O, and NO2, which means we need to get rid of those other two things. So we still need to add something here. Good. Well, if we get equation 2 here, equation 2 has ozone and 3 halves of an O2. If we add it like it is, though, it's not going to cancel anything out. The next one, but reverse it, right. We can reverse it. So if we reverse this equation, reverse, then the equation will look like this. 3 halves of an O2 goes to O3, right? 
when we reverse that, what ha does that do to our delta H value? Good, plus 142.3. So let's add that in and see what happens. I'll change color here. So the reverse of equation three is three halves of an O2 gas goes to O3 gas and had a delta H value of plus 142.3. Everybody see where that came from? Reverse equation two. When we add this together, NO is going to come straight down, and O is going to come straight down. But what is going to happen to that O3 there? What's going to happen to this O3? It's going to cancel with this O3 because those are on opposite sides of the equation, which we know from algebra means we canceled them out. What's going to happen with the three halves of oxygen? It's going to cancel with this one because, again, they're on opposite sides of the equation. And we're left with just NO2 on the product side. And what will our delta H value be? That's what it's supposed to have too. I don't know why. You're right. Here too. What's our delta H going to be now? Good. 304.1. Yeah. Well, we've only got three sig figs, so we're just going to do negative 304 kilojoules per mole. And there's our fan final answer. is yay they were so good at explaining how to get there <laughs> yeah easy just you know do that how do you feel about that good all right that's pretty like much like the hardest problem from chapter five i think so the very last sex section we will cover on Tuesday, but to, but we have um, lab tomorrow. Other than that, that was all I had for today. Unless you have any questions.